Welcome everyone as we come to celebrate this Good Friday. My name's Steve Larkin and I'm leading the service here this morning on this uh, rather solemn occasion really. We gather today with Christians from around the world to meditate upon the events that we call Good Friday. And I've tried to design the worship service this morning as an opportunity for you to reflect on how those events some 2,000 years ago impact upon your life today and in our world and, and across, across our society. We're going to hear the story again in scripture, through song and through video. And as we engage with each of those media, I invite you to really to listen for your own story in that story. There'll be quite a lot of silence throughout the service. We're not going to be talking the whole time. And I'd like you to also, um, I want to use one of the traditions of the church, not often used in uniting type churches or Baptists or those sort of churches, but the Easter weekend, of which we started this weekend, is regarded as one unit. And so the, or even starting on Thursday night, but particularly Friday morning where we are, that the service doesn't actually conclude at the end of the hour or whatever we'll be here, but continues through the weekend. Um, in some of the more traditions, you would fast and pray, maybe go on retreat for that time. And the service concludes actually on Sunday morning as, as, a, as a block. Now, I'm not suggesting that you all have to do all the other bits and pieces, but at the end of the service, we will simply conclude the service with a reading. There won't be a benediction because we're not finishing the service. Um, and I will invite you to, to leave silently. If you want to in prayer, reflecting, um, please do that. I'll be around to support you if you would like someone to pray with. Um, otherwise, just if you could just leave quietly so that other people can can um, sit in the space that's here. The service, the, the reading at the end of the service will be read by John and, and Ray Layton and it's an interesting reading and you'll, you will need to, to listen. The words won't be on the screen. It's a reading that combines both the story of Jesus' birth and the story of his death in a parallel sort of fashion. And it, they just sort of work off each other. So I just encourage you to try and engage in how that um, speaks to you this morning. Just a couple of brief announcements. Uh, we have an Easter Sunday service here at 9am and online. And uh, we've one at the Horton Street Chapel at 11am on Sunday as well. Um, a little advance notice, the 1st of May service at Horton Street has been cancelled due to the Ironman competition. I'm afraid our congregation there couldn't compete with the Ironman. <laughs> um, also, there was to be a sunrise service down at uh, Town Beach on Sunday morning, but that's been cancelled for this year. Um, there were some administrative issues that meant they couldn't put it together in time. And just the last one, in case you're not here on Sunday morning, I am start my leave after the service on Sunday, <laughs> or maybe after coffee on Sunday, and um, I'll be away for a month. Uh, Loffa will be uh, in charge of the place, along with Ross, I guess, but um, if you need any particular issues, please contact Loffa in the first instance. As we gather this morning, we acknowledge that we are meeting on the land of the Biripai people, and we are thankful for their care of the land over the centuries and we pay our respect to their elders, past, present and future.
from Isaiah 53. Indeed, who would ever believe it? Who would possibly accept what we've been told? Who has witnessed the awesome power and plan of the eternal in action? Yet it was our suffering that he carried, our pain and distress, our sick to the soulness. We just figured that God had rejected him, that God was the reason he hurt so badly. But he was hurt because of us. He suffered so. Our wrongdoing wounded and crushed him. He endured the breaking that made us whole. The injuries he suffered became our healing. Let us pray. O oh God, all our sin, all our hatred, all our violence, all our apathy, all our convenient neglect came together in that dark hour when they snuffed out the light of your goodness, when they crucified your Son, our Lord. And we come to remember. O oh God, all your love, all your compassion, all your goodness, all your forgiveness came together in that life and that dying, your undying and unending love. When they crucified your Son, our Lord, and we remember. O oh God, all of his story, all of human history, all our story repeats itself where hate meets love, where injustice meets justice, where despair meets hope, death meets life. And we dare to believe we were there when they crucified your son, our Lord, and that this is none other than the way also to truth and life. And we remember. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing just a verse of that beautiful song, Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? Please be seated. My apologies for the mix-up in words there. We're now going to begin to hear the story of this day 2,000 year ago, years ago as recorded, by, recorded in Mark's Gospel. And as each story is read, I really encourage you to imagine yourself there in that story, to be one of the players on the page, so to speak, as one of the characters. Who might you have been like in that part of the story? What might you have done when you were there? I'm going to invite Jesse to come and bring us that first um, part of the story.
When it was evening, he came with the twelve. And when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him, one after another, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Who are you at the table? Were well, you there as one of the disciples? Jesus' last meal, arguing over who is the greatest? Perhaps if they'd really known, they may have behaved differently. But I suspect not. Or what about Judas? Were you Judas? Was it greed for the money or the power or disappointment that led him to betray Jesus? Who might you have been at the table? For those of you here, last Sunday we started with Dave the donkey. I want to pick up some of that story again this morning as we hear what happened next. So, Grandpa, you've been in Jerusalem since then because uh, Dave was the donkey for those who are new here um, who Jesus rode on into Jerusalem and he was telling his grandpa about the excitement of that. So he says, so Grandpa, you've been in Jerusalem since then. Tell me what happened next. Did the crowd keep cheering for the king? Well, Dave, the crowd were yelling for the king. Wow, said Dave. And I'm sure all the leaders came to meet him. Yes, sighed Grandpa. The king did meet all the leaders. And Grandpa, they, they would have placed a golden crown on a, upon the king's head. Well, they certainly crowned the king, but it wasn't made of gold. Well, the throne, Grandpa, the throne. They must have led the king into the palace, sat him on the throne and cheered, Long live the king! No, Dave, sighed Grandpa. There was no throne. They led the king out of Jerusalem and they nailed him to a cross. Dave was stunned. A cross? So, so the king, the king is dead. Thanks, Barry. They went out to the Mount of Olives. They went to a place called Gethsemane 
And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little further, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass him, pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Who are you in the garden? In the garden, Jesus prayed that the path ahead would be changed, that the trials he was to face would disappear. The temptation to do it easy in life, to decide that the cost of being a follower of Jesus. How often have we desperately desired a different path? Will Jesus' prayer, not my will, but yours be done, be your prayer? I invite you to stand and sing as we sing that beautiful hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards, warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. But even on this point, their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But he was silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. Who are you at the Sanhedrin? The religious leaders, perhaps it was their greed for power and money that led them to this. Perhaps not all of them agreed, but none spoke out against the conviction. Peter, were you Peter? Peter at least had the guts to follow Jesus to where he was to be tried in this kangaroo court by the religious leaders of the day. He wanted to be strong. He wanted to be faithful. But he failed at that moment. But at least Peter's remorse led him to find forgiveness and redemption. When have you failed but found forgiveness and redemption?
As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival he used to release a prisoner for them, any one for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the resurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realised that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him, to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, crucify him. Pilate asked them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Who do you identify with at Pilate's place? Pilate, squirming between appeasing the Roman overlords and keeping the Jewish religious leaders happy? Barabbas, the first person for whom Jesus literally died, for it should have been him on the cross. Instead, the innocent is terribly punished and the guilt, guilty go free. Is that your story of faith? Of God bringing new life, new hope and redemption? stand and sing together our next song, Glory Be to Jesus.
Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole cohort, and they clothed him in a purple cloak. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him, Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. How would it be minding your own business and getting caught up in some other person's troubles? But for Simon, Jesus' suffering and death, the promise and power of God's love changed his life. When we give our lives in service to another, it not only changes them, but it changes us. How has the sacrifice of Jesus changed your life? I'm going to take a moment to turn our attention to our world through the receiving of our offering and through some prayers for others. I just invite Glyn to bring our offering forward. And she does, let us pray. Generous God, as we remember this day the gift of your Son who gave his all for us, please bless these offerings that we bring. Guide us in using them wisely in sharing your love and your grace. In Christ's name. Amen. I invite you to respond um, with what will be on the screen in a moment um, as we share our prayers for others together. Just waiting for it to come up. If you could um, join in with the last line, O God of the cross, deliver us from evil. Let us pray. We seek your saving grace, God of Christ Jesus, for all those who on this Good Friday are lost among their doubts, sins, griefs or fears. O crucified Christ, have mercy on your sisters and brothers. O God of the cross, deliver us from all evil. For those who suffer gravely from the cruel abuse of their fellows and all who suffer because of the apathy and neglect of respectable people. O 
O crucified Christ, have mercy on your sisters and brothers. O God of the cross, deliver us from all evil. For some who are suffering from disease or accident, and the many who suffer because of terrorism and war, and we pray particularly today for the people of Ukraine. O crucified Christ, have mercy on your sisters and brothers. For people who bear their suffering alone and unaided, and others who through those surrounded by medical personnel and equipment still find their pain unbearable. O crucified Christ, have mercy on your sisters and brothers, O God of the cross. For those who suffer abuse at home or at work, and the many children who suffer from the bullying or rejection of their peers, O crucified Christ, have mercy on your sisters and brothers. O God of the cross, deliver us from all evil. For those who in their suffering have no faith to support them, and any whose once vibrant faith seems to be ebbing away under stress. O crucified Christ, have mercy on your sisters and brothers. O God of the cross, deliver us from all evil. And for all who in suffering still trust and praise their God, and those who while suffering themselves still give comfort to their distressed friends and loved ones. O crucified Christ, have mercy on your sisters and brothers. O God of the cross, deliver us from all evil. Loving God, we commit into your hands our lives, that in sickness or in health, in joy or in sorrow, we may carry without grumbling whatever cross you give us and always have time and love for those who are falling down under the weight of their hardship. This we ask through Christ Jesus, our Redeemer. Amen. Thanks, Barry. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Ah, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, Save yourself and come down from the cross. I'm going to stand and sing another verse of Were you there when they crucified my Lord? But we need to make sure we got the same words as you. Last time we didn't. <laughs> Nailed him to the tree. Excellent. Please stand. Thank you. 
be seen. We have been reflecting on that terrible story that traces the events from Thursday night through to Friday some 2,000 years ago. A story beginning with the last meal of Jesus with his disciples, a story of Judas' betrayal of Jesus with a kiss, a story of the arrest and the mock trial, the beatings, the humiliation, a story of Jesus being nailed to the cross, left to die. As a congregation, we've been over the Lenten season, been reflecting on the Apostles' Creed and we've been looking at foundational understandings of God and of God's action in and through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in the world, the place of the church in the mission of God. And today we're moving to the second last statement of that creed, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. Now each Sunday as a church and often I'm sure each of us during the week as individual regularly say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to God. I'm sorry to somebody in our household, somebody down the street. I'm sorry. Sorry for this. Sorry for that. Often it just rolls off the tongue without really much thought or or sense of consequence. Jesus, during his time on the cross, uttered seven phrases. We usually call them the seven last words of Christ, but they're really the last seven phrases of Christ, I guess. Seven precious, pain-filled phrases. And the first of these, traditionally, is the one that says, follow what they are doing. Crucifixion is a crucifixion is a horribly cruel way to die. It's not from blood loss or anything else. It's primarily as the person struggles on the cross to breathe. As time goes on, they don't have the energy to push themselves up anymore as they hang there. And they become weaker and weaker and they essentially die from asphyxiation. And to To speak in that situation is to push up on your feet and pull up on your hands with limited breath to say a few words. And so in that sense, these words that Jesus did offer on the cross uh, would have been pain-filled, important, precious words for us to, to remember. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. I want to just take a few moments to reflect on those words of Jesus. The first word Jesus utters is Father. Probably not surprising. Even atheists have been known to cry out to God when things get bad enough, when they need something. And usually our children, when they fall and hurt themselves, certainly when they're young, will cry out, Mum, Dad, as someone who can come and rescue them from that situation. I know in terms of prayer, usually when I'm in a tough spot, I, I usually say, God, get me out of this. <laughs> I need a solution. But Jesus, in an unselfish way, in that horrible situation, prays to his Father for forgiveness for them. So the second thing we note is, he, is that he prays for forgiveness. When we say to someone, I forgive you, it implies that they've done something wrong. You wouldn't say, I forgive you for something that they haven't done that's wrong. And so when Jesus is praying from the cross aloud, he's making it clear actually to all people around the world and from that time forward that they've strayed from God's path They've violated God's order and they need to be forgiven. I think in many ways regarding this as the first word of the cross is important because it gives the why he's on the cross to bring forgiveness. Because we've got a heart condition. We tend to stray from God's path. And that word for sin is amatia in the Greek 
and accused of an archer firing at a bullseye and missing the centre, of missing the mark, of straying from the path, of which we all do. When we go the way we're not supposed to, we hurt each other. There's not enough food to feed everyone. Yet if we followed God's path, there would be no wars, there would be no abuse. People would treat each other with love and respect. But when we fail to go down God's path, when we fail to miss or when we miss the mark, we fall into what we call sin. I was thinking, it's hard to imagine a world where everyone kept to the path, where everyone did the right thing all the time. I just, seems incomprehensible to me that could be. But I, but I believe that's the promise of heaven. And I also believe that we can realise that at least partially today when we reach out and forgive others, when we forgive ourselves, when we receive God's forgiveness into our lives, when we look for the best in others, when we build bridges and not walls between people. You know, sometimes the church is accused of only ever talking about sin and guilt that really is not the focus of the Gospels. The focus of the Gospel is not that you're a sinner, but that God is a saviour. It's not that you're guilty, but that God offers you grace. But the catch in all that is that we don't really understand we need grace and forgiveness until we realise that we've got a problem. If you go to the doctor and says, and you say, for a checkup, and the doctor says, Well, you've got this and this wrong with you. You don't say, Well, I'm going to go and find a doctor who's telling me I'm good. Well, you could. I think some people do. I don't like what that doctor said. It must be wrong. You want a doctor who says, Well, this is what's wrong. And if you do this, you'll be better. We can operate, take this pill, whatever it might be. We've got a God that's like that. God's diagnosed the problem and offered the solution. Thank God. Because all of us stray from the path and the Easter season is particularly a time when we have the opportunity to examine our own hearts and our own minds, to look at the way we think, the values we have, the words we say, how we act, how we think, so that we can identify where we've strayed so that we can, with God's grace, come back on the right path. God's gift of grace has been given before we even asked. And in that statement of Jesus, he says, God forgive them. The church has always believed that we are the them, that he has, was praying for us, praying for every human being that would be born from that time on and I think perhaps even before that time. We sang a couple of those verses, were you, were you there when they crucified my Lord? And it's really a rhetorical statement. Yes, you were there. You weren't physically there. But I was there because I'm a part of the problem. Tony Campalo says that Jesus is Lord of time and space and we can picture Jesus on the cross staring down through history at, to the moment when he comes to me to you and he looks into your eyes and he cries out your name and says, Steve, Steve, Father, forgive Steve for he doesn't know what he's done. You say to Jesse, Jesse, Father, forgive Jesse for he doesn't know what she's doing. To Becky, to Heather, to Miriam, to every single person here, God speaking your name, Father, Forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. That word of forgiveness is for you and for me now. We are one of the them. Remember the words of Romans 5. 
You see, at just the right time, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though, says Paul, for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I invite John and Ray to bring us our reading. After that, please leave in silence when you thanks John and Ray. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be enrolled. This was the first enrolment when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, You brought me, you brought me this man as one who was perverting the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. And all went to be enrolled to their own cities. And Joseph also went up from Galilee from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, to be enrolled with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. 
but they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified. And their voices prevailed. So Pilate gave sentence that their demand should be granted. He released Barabbas, the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, who they asked for. But Jesus he delivered up to their will. And while they were there, the time came for her to be delivered. And when they came to the place, which is called the skull, there they crucified him, and two criminals, one on the right and one on the left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And in that region there were shepherds out in the fields watching over their flock by night. And the people stood by watching. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be for all people. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. And this will be a sign for you. While the sun's light failed, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling cloths. Then Joseph of Arimathea took down the body of Jesus and wrapped it in a linen shroud. And lying in a manger. And laid him in a rock-hewn tomb. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God to the highest, and on earth peace among those whom God is pleased. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid and returned and prepared spices and ointments. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened that the Lord has made known to us. And on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, 
they did not find the body. And when the shepherds saw the babe lying in the manger, they made known the saying which had been told them concerning the child. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Remember how they told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds had told them. But Mary kept all these things, pondering them in her heart. And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to the rest. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as it had been told them. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to Christ. 